Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Arthur Millick. I'm the executive director of the Claremont Institute Center for the American Way of Life. Um, few people understand what AI is uh, and what it'll lead to. Most people are divided uh, on what exactly uh, we should think about it. Uh, it's either terrifying or exhilarating, a revolution to be greeted or stopped uh, if possible. Where there is no division is that every major world power has by now seen its utility and its power. And there's a world competition afoot to produce the best results from it. The most powerful nations on earth, the US, the UK, Russia, China, perhaps Israel, are all under a great deal of pressure to produce results. And our goal tonight is to understand, first and foremost, what exactly AI is, what it can be applied to uh, domestically and abroad, uh, how it will help us, uh, America, how it will help our adversaries, and what are the moral stakes involved in this revolution that is taking place. I hope that we'll have a productive discussion, uh, a great deal of back and forth. Uh, we are here with uh, some remarkable people I'll introduce them all just very briefly. Uh, to my right is Yossi Marie Griffiths, president uh, of Dakota State University, member of the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. She served in presidential uh, appointments to the National Science Board, the US President's Information Technology Advisory Committee, and the US National Commission on Libraries and Information Sciences. Ari Shulman on the other end, is the editor of The New Atlantis, as well as the editor of The New Atlantis book series. His writings have appeared in a variety of places, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, The Atlantic, Commentary. Before this, he was uh, an, a research assistant in the opinion department of The New York Times. Uh, next is David Goldman, my colleague at the Claremont Institute, Washington Fellow. He's also a deputy editor at the Asia Times. He's written uh, as Spangler, the Spangler column in the Asian Times and PJ Media, and is author of a book on China, You Will Be Assimilated, China's Plan to Sinoform the World. Arthur Herman is a senior fellow and director of the Quantum Alliance Initiative at the Hudson Institute. Dr. Herman has served on the National Security Council, a senior advisor to the National Security Advisor, and co-chairs the Hamilton Commission on Securing America's National Security Innovation Base. He's author of 10 books, among which is a Pulitzer Prize, a Pulitzer Prize finalist, and a New York Times bestseller, but his most recent book is The Viking Heart, How Scandinavians Conquered the World. Uh, and finally is Joseph Bottom. He is director of the Classics Institute, a cyber ethics program at Dakota State University and poet and poetry editor uh, of the New York Sun. He has a PhD in medieval philosophy and most recently has published his fourth collection of poetry called Spending the Winter. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, panelists. I'd like to start with a very broad question uh, for Joseph Bottom. Uh, nobody really knows what AI is uh, in the world outside of this panel. It's confusing. It has many applications. It's new. And some claim, including yourself, that it's a revolution. Explain, please. I'm not sure nobody knows. The people who are actually doing it know. The trouble is that the word AI or that I call it a word. Um, the acronym AI is ambiguous. It's an equivocal word. Um, and it's used in two different senses by the general public and journalists on the one side, and in another sense by the people who do it technically. And the, tr the divide between those two uses of the word is one of the reasons that those who do know have such trouble communicating with policymakers and the rest of them who are using it in a different sense. Now, you know, we can, these, these lines are blurry, but in one sense, there's, it, when Amazon sends you an ad that seems particularly targeted to you, 90% of Americans will call that AI. It's not. It's algorithmic programming done on fast machines with big data, right? Whereas AI is technically, black box pattern recognition um, done on a huge data set and it is black box in the, in the sense that you cannot enter into the programming to inquire of it why it's matching these patterns. The, these two different uses mean that when um, people testify to Congress and we see befuddled Congress members 
interviewing or asking questions of them, they're befuddled because they're thinking it's what's going on with robots or it's what's going on with Amazon sending you or Google sending you particular ads. And in fact, these three things, true AI, big data, algorithmic programming, and robotics, they're starting to grow together, but they have not grown together yet. Uh, quantum computing is another of these phrases that gets used ambiguously. On the one hand, to mean fast happening computing, and on the other hand, to mean literally replacing electricity with quantum parallel effects. Uh, and the, the result of this lack of <coughs> understanding leads to confusion, <laughs> leads to some of the, um, the doom saying that we hear, uh, and we, we want to sort it out. Now, as I say, they are growing together, uh, and perhaps they'll achieve that. But the key to recognize here for why we're up here discussing this, why it's so important, why I helped put together this panel of really brilliant people, is because something has happened in the last year and a half or two years, something really astonishing. Google could build a true AI, black box pattern recognition program, self-trainable, that could build, beat the world's greatest, easily the world's greatest uh, performer at the Asian game of Go. Right? It only cost them $25 million. In the last year and a half, the building blocks of AI programming have reduced to 10% of them, or even less. A few chatbots, as President Griffiths was just saying to me, chatbots are easy. Um, a group of Stanford students recently built a chatbox AI for $7,000. And that reduction in cost over the last year and a half or two years makes the economics of AI suddenly much more interesting, much more debilitating. And also, it means that when Google was building these 20 million or $200 million uh, AI programs, they were doing it with the top engineers in the world. And the construction now into these Available programming building blocks means that you can do it with the second tier engineers and the third tier engineers. You don't need the world's greatest geniuses to do this anymore. And suddenly, true AI effects are available in ways that I believe would shock you, but are at least portending enormous changes in warfare, in economics, in social control. Thank you. President Griffiths, maybe you can pick up here. Uh, what, what exactly would the applications be uh, in terms of the federal government, how they're thinking about it? Who will be the producer of these uh, technologies, how they'll be applied? Hey, thank you. Well, I'll, first of all, I'll start, Joe. Um, you're talking really about generative AI rather than other classes of what has been called AI in the past, and that's what's changed so dramatically over the last year. I'll come back to that later, perhaps talk about complex systems and some phenomena there. Um, but if you look at the federal government, I think we can separate out the Department of Defense from the civilian parts of the government. I think their uses are a little bit different. The Defense Department has been moving ahead quite ambitiously um, created a joint AI center um, and has been the different branches of the military have been uh, engaging with AI and you couldn't talk to that much more effectively. On the civilian side, they've been much, much slower to implement. Um, and one of the reasons I made my comments about chat boxes as I look to Estonia, Estonia has a tremendous e-government um, capability, and every single branch of government, every single service that that government provides ha is, is fronted by a chat box that does the sort of the easy kinds of questions and answers and then passes people on to uh, actual individuals to deal with the more complex problems that, that they might be dealing with. So I do think that's one. The biggest problem they have in the government um, is the, the lack of personnel. And we are now looking at how do we use AI in ways that can help um, allow, allow us to be much more productive in whatever it is, we do, whatever tasks we have, so that we can better serve the individuals that each, each agency is intended to serve. And what would that look like? 
I, I think that would look like a set of tools that can be used by people who don't have to be the top engineers at all, that they can use AI. I do think people have to have somewhat of an understanding of the, limit, the limitations and capabilities of the AI that they're dealing with. Um, and they all have capabilities and limitations. We might not know all the limitations yet, but they certainly exist. Um, and I think the, the other concern that um, we're talking about, in fact, I'm talking about next week, in Washington is the issue of the tier of, of jobs that are going to be displaced and replaced. People who deal with text, sorry, authors, um, people who deal with text, uh, copy editors, reviewers, um, people who are entering data that can be done much more effectively. And that class of jobs tend to be filled by females. And so there's going to be a somewhat disproportionate effect on, on the employment of women unless we can find ways to, um, to skill them or upskill them, if you like, into other kinds of positions. I have no doubt that we will find plenty more things for people to do. And that's the civilian side. That's the civilian you, side, yes. I, I guess. Would you like to say a few words about the defense side? Well, as I say, the defense has, has moved quite uh, rigorously uh, with AI over the last, uh, you know, couple of decades. Um, they have been, I mean, the, you know, predicting where ships are going to be at any one point in time, um, uh, deploying drones. Um, we do have um, drones that really run autonomously once they're once they're set off by the human. Um, I think there are sets of guidelines and principles that. Um, uh, the United States and its allies operate under in terms of what they can do with weapons and how they can function. And the key, I think, in uh, in, in that environment is the uh, the human, the role of the human. We talk about the human in the loop, humans involved in decision making as, as the intelligences are going along, or the human on the loop that tends to be the person who says, okay, I'm going to deploy these drones to go and target these areas. And once they've gone, they're autonomous. So there are many different things that they can do, but I, I, I can't get too deep into it because my clearance, you could probably go a little yes. bit more, but you've also got clearance, so there are things you can talk about. Yes, and maybe that's what we should do, that at least looking at China and some of the things that they've already uh, used AI on in the military application, maybe Arthur Herman. Schiff. Sure. <clears throat> um, first of all, I want to say <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and with a, such a distinguished panel, and to sit and to talk about this in front of an audience that exhibits uh, so much natural intelligence, um, one ten, tends to forget <laughs> about the importance of that. Um, and whoever the wag who said, I really encourage uh, artificial intelligence because there's so little natural intelligence around, um, didn't, didn't know this audience and didn't know what, uh, what's taking place here. I'm really glad that Jody mentioned the... Um, the watershed moment in 2017, um, when uh, the uh, AlphaGo, the AI program that had been put together by DeepMind, um, defeated China's most uh, exalted uh, champion uh, at the Chinese think of as their national national game, namely Go, and it has to be said that the that the series of matches that they had the the artificial intelligence program didn't just beat the Chinese champion, it humiliated him. I mean, it just, he couldn't, he couldn't find his way out of problems that the AI was able to anticipate and to make moves and changes. It was a frightening, frightening moment. And, and as I say, very bad, very bad news for, for uh, the national game of Go. Now that moment, 2017 was a game changer in more ways than one because what it did was there was a lot of attention in the West, you know, really impressive. I mean, we've seen computers beat champions at chess, but Go is a much more complicated, much more complicated game. Uh, so many more strategies and so many different uh, combinations of moves that it was definitely impressive. But for the for the uh, leadership of the um, Chinese Communist Party, it was it was a watershed moment, and in particular for President Xi. And it suddenly became clear to them that AI was going to be the, the technology of the future um, and that whoever it was was going to dominate artificial intelligence would be the dominant power in the world. Um, that inspired President Xi that same year then to announce an entire initiative. 
and spending $150 billion uh, to make China into the world's first AI-driven nation. Um, and then and in China, what happens is, is if President Xi says something is really important, uh, then you realize it really is important. And you need to and, and then adjust your entire departments, your companies, your communities, entire agenda around what President Xi has told you is in fact very important. And that's precisely what happened, is, is that the push to integrate and to extend artificial intelligence and its partner, the machine learning, which I always like the term machine learning because I think it kind of captures the real nature of what's happening. This is about machines learning to mimic and imitate human reasoning in all its different facets and doing it in more and more sophisticated ways as it goes on. That's not an unfair characterization, no. is it? So in any case, uh, the drive then for artificial intelligence then permeates every aspect of, of China's government, but also of its society. Uh, we are familiar, I think, from headlines and from news stories and documentaries about one of the more egregious aspects of this push to have an AI-driven a government, AI-driven state, and that is the way in which it, it, artificial intelligence and machine learning were integrated into China's already existing total surveillance state as a way of using facial recognition to keep track of dissidents, to use it as a way to uh, administer uh, rewards and punishments through the social credit system, uh, to basically keep tabs of every person belonging to the Uyghur minority, where they went, what they ate, when they ventured, dared to venture into a mosque, uh, who they met with, et cetera, et cetera. It, it has taken on, I think, very frightening, by our standards, certainly, and by anybody's standards, let's face it, very frightening uh, uh, perspective from that. But the other institution that really fastened onto AI, and even earlier really than President Xi, was the Chinese military, the People's Liberation Army. And what they had seen there was a possibility for using artificial intelligence to gain an insuperable advantage on the battlefield by applying that technology in various important uh, and really decisive ways. Now, it has to be said, to come back to our, us, to the, our own DOD, that many of these ways in which they go about this are ways that our own DOD is pursuing. They recognize, too, this, can, this is a winning winning technology in a lot of ways. Um, you already mentioned one of them, and that is its use with autonomous systems, right? With UAVs, drones, as a way in which to control and direct and find, identify targets and, and then use them to, uh, to, to either mark them or kill them or whatever else that comes up. Uh, another, and with that, then the development of what we call swarm technology. In other words, using AI as a way in which you can use and coordinate the motions of not just one or two or a team of drones, but thousands of them if you need to, to swarm the way bees or hornets or birds, and that this can be a powerful tool to be used on the battlefield. The use of it in terms of facial recognition for targeting, for example, of enemies and the use of it in, in that regard. The use of it in terms of simply information, information uh, uh, and data analytics. The Chinese have thousands of sensors all over the distributed all over the world, including including deep in the ocean, which are gathering information all the time, which become grist for the artificial intelligence mills that the PLA uses to understand what they're doing, what opponents are doing, to understand the general movements of populations of ships, etc., uh, and all the other kinds of fascinating things to do with information. But they've also, at the same time, and I want to mention the, the other one, which I think is very important, is they've also come to use it, and this is an area in which our DOD has not moved into yet, in what is called cognitive warfare. And that is of not only being able to speed up the decision time with which you are able to arrive at the range of choices of what's the best possible one, which is what the data analytics does. It provides you with a range of options. Here's your options based on the best available information, here's the ones that we think are the best you choose, right? Decision-making. But not only to make to improve the decision-making from the point of view of the analysis of the information by the machine, 
but to improve the analysis by the human brain of actually finding ways in which AI can become the new the extension of the neural neural networks of the human brain itself, which moves them into the area of 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 biotechnology, uh, moves them into the area also of bio warfare. Because if you can find ways in which AI can make your warriors smarter, you can also <laughs> find ways to use AI to make your enemies stupider, right? To confuse them, to make it impossible for them to make the right kinds of choices and directions here. And I predict to you, well, one of the new, one of the future frontiers that we're going to have to be aware of because the Chinese are moving in this direction, that we need to also now think about what are the limits, both in terms of technology and the ethics, is the area of cognitive warfare and the ways in which AI can become both a tool but also a form of control over the functioning of human minds within a given population and within a given set of situations. That's where the Chinese are going. I think it's one of the things we need, we'll need to think about. And David Goldman, these are questions identical to what you've been thinking on, uh, with one exception, the Chinese uh, application of AI to their economy. Um, can you say a little bit about that and maybe where you differ from Arthur Herman in terms of the military applications that we're already seeing? Well, uh, military technology really isn't my field. I have uh, spent a lot of time visiting China, talking to practitioners and looking at facilities. Um, the black box systems, which allow you to take enormous data sets and analyze them in a way that you can't back out the pathway, which, you, uh, which led you to the conclusion, have enormous applications to very humdrum, boring forms of economic drudgery. And that's sure. in some ways in which they have the biggest economic effect. So, for example, if you have a, if you have an, a conveyor belt coming out of a factory and you need to do quality control, pick out the bad parts, uh, you have a camera which will take 5,000 pictures a minute. It'll transmit them to a computer and use an enormous data set. It's trained on millions of examples. And just as AI can... You know, after enough examples, can, rec can distinguish a cat from a dog by looking at the combinations of pixels, the, uh, the AI system will tell you that particular part is defective. The same for a batch of coal in an underground mine. Is there an impurity in it or a piece of junk that got in which could crush the jaws of the grinder that you're sending the coal into? Or uh, preventive maintenance is a, key, is a key one. At what point can you detect an anomaly in the performance of the machine which requires this to be changed. So China has done a great deal in this, and it's the combination of fast data transmission. It could be 5G or Wi-Fi. The Chinese made a big deal about 5G, which they dominate, and the computation, which do this. And I'm told that uh, even the first generation of 5G is overwhelmed by the demand for data. Uh, so Huawei is now introducing what they call 5.5G with about a 40% uh, turbocharge on this. Uh, this has uh, enormous implications for industrial productivity. I visited Huawei headquarters at the beginning of August, and I saw a port, Tianjin port, number nine in the world, where giant automated cranes communicating by 5G use AI algorithms to empty a large container ship in about 45 minutes. It takes 24 to 48 hours in Long Beach, California. That's all factories with assembly lines using a great deal of AI applications, which are quite impressive. And if you look at China's electric vehicle industry, which certainly dominates the sector, uh, AI applications of industry are very important. But it's not only in high-tech industry. For example, uh, in Bangladesh, while we worked with a food manufacturing company, food processing company that packages dried peppers. And if you get one bad pepper in the bag, it'll ruin the whole bag. So they had a 30% spoilage rate. By using a high-speed camera with an AI algorithm, they were able to identify the peppers and basically reduce the spoilage rate to next to zero. Or in Africa, where you have people who for the first time have a smartphone because 
Huawei or ZTE have come in and built a digital network, uh, you can see who's making payments on that network, whom they're making payments to, and where they are physically. Are they actually in the market? And on that basis, there's an AI algorithm that banks are using to extend microcredit to very poor individuals. This has transformational implications for very poor countries where people are now earning $2 a day. This is the kind of thing that gets people up to $10 or $15 a day. Having gone through exactly that kind of transformation themselves, the Chinese are pretty good at that. Data and data transmission and computation are the three elements here. They're all equally important. China dominates the 5G at this point. Huawei and ZTE are the largest uh, share in the market, and Huawei's R&D budget is $25 billion a year. Its two largest competitors, Nokia and Ericsson, together are only $9 billion. So that gives you an idea of what you're up against. Um, the applications uh, are very much geared towards improving productivity in things that don't interest our top data sciences because they're boring and stupid. But Huawei, uh, I'll conclude with this, uh, in May announced a, a, a do-it-yourself system where you put in your own data or you buy the data from them. You the, put this together for your business and you have your own AI algorithm. Uh, it's called, the system's called Pangu. And Huawei claims they've got 10,000 factories that they're now wiring up with 5G and propagating AI systems. Uh, last week, I spoke to the team at one of the largest U.S. Tel telcos. Uh, I won't mention which one. I asked, well, Walmart says they've got 10,000 customers for this stuff. How many customers do you have? They said, well, at this point, it's aspirational. I said, you need to know if anyone signed up yet. They said, that's correct. They haven't gotten the first check from a customer. So the danger that I see strategically is not only the warfighting capabilities that Arthur was talking about, but the industrial base and soft power capabilities. Right now, we can't produce enough 155 millimeter shells. We clearly have issues. China is a much larger industrial power than we are. And if things continue the way they are, it seems very likely that the gap between China's industrial capacities and the United States will only widen further to the detriment uh, of American power. Say a great deal more about it, but I'll leave it there. Thank you. But uh, let me just follow up on this and, and open it up to others, maybe. So uh, I know, David, that you are uh, pessimistic on how far American industries have taken this so far. But has anybody else seen evidence that uh, of some budding, promising elements that American industry will capture whatever advantages they can find in AI in the way that the Chinese have at well, Huawei? Uh, you have a lot of flex manufacturing, which a lot of which is AI-driven going on. Uh, for, uh, Los Angeles has become a mini manufacturing center for the first time. Uh, one of the great things about AI is it's an equalizer. A startup can suddenly be as productive as a company that's been doing this for 100 years, a small shop can get the economies of scale by using big data that a large shop can. So from the standpoint of a challenger coming from behind, AI definitely gives us perspective advantages, and you see pockets of it at this point. You see potential, but it's not enough to move the needle in terms of the aggregates yet. President Griffiths, I see you nodding along. Uh, maybe you can say a few words on this topic or, or whether you think that there is some role for the federal government to spur on some kind of investment to get industry uh, more interested. Those are two very different questions. Yeah. Just, just to follow up, I think uh, China also has this um, uh, tremendous ability to scale up whatever they develop. They've got excellent software engineers that are able to uh, move move their own needle out very, very quickly. We don't seem to have quite as many um, working in concert or from top-down orders to actually implement systems on a very large scale. So base. it sounds to me like a workforce issue. Mm -hmm. There is definitely a workforce issue, absolutely, in, in, uh, in AI and in STEM generally. Yeah. We have a workforce issue, and we've trained 
<laughs> We've educated and trained a large number of, uh, of Chinese uh, engineers as well, of course. Um, yes. So that was one issue. Um, the other one you were asking, sorry. Um, Federal investments to help investments, industry. Yes, thank you. Um, well, you know, there have been attempts with the, the Chips and Science Act um, to uh, have the federal government invest, in, particularly in uh, R&D, and particularly on the development side of R&D. Um, that uh, has not been fully funded. So the, the concern I have is when I went on the National Security Commission on AI, it was 2019, um, and one of the things we we talked about um, as we generated a whole series of reports and policy documents was in fact that we needed to have a real sense of urgency here. This wasn't something we could just sit back and wait and take our time and make a decision. And here we are four years later, and we're still... <laughs> There's a, there's a very good word, faffing around, uh, which is sort of, you know, you're going like this back and forth, and that's what we're doing. We're faffing around and we're not making decisions. Um, industry, the big tech is moving with what it's moving on, but the federal government is still trying to understand what AI is and what it isn't. And so I, I'm disappointed in a way that for all the bipartisan rhetoric that, yes, this is, this is important, this is going to be important to the future. We don't want China to take the lead. We really have to preserve our, our democratic values. We need to get the world to, to work with us in that sense. Not a lot has happened and at, 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 at a general level. That concerns me. And I don't know, um, you know, I'm often asked to comment on what's going on in Europe versus what's going on in the United States for different reasons. And, um, you know, the, the Europeans worked on their AI Act for many, many years, and it looks as though they're going to be able to implement large chunks of it. Um, and we really don't even have a framework at this point in this country to start talking about the guardrails that everybody's... That everybody's you know, that, the same things happen with quantum technology, mm -hmm. too. <laughs> Europeans have their act together a lot faster and have an overall game plan. You know, I have to tell you, I read, I was asked to read early drafts of that mm -hmm. report. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I said, which I thought was, was very good, very comprehensive, but I thought that one of the challenges with it was that, number one, I felt it wasn't, didn't say the, the, uh, enough, at least on the early drafts, about China and about the, the really threat. I won't use the term existential threat, but if China grabs the advantage with it. Um, but that it also seemed to me to be very much... Uh, driven by the uh, idea that, that, that government funding could really bring about big changes and movements, not just within the government itself, but also that this would have a ripple effect down through the economy and in the private sector um, as well. And what I really have felt from the beginning is, is that the AI revolution is very much of a bottoms-up revolution, don't you think? And that in many ways... The, the, one of the big challenges the government faces, you know, Jeff, government, government is really good at making sh thing, sure things don't happen. It's one of its key and most important roles. And in the private sector, one of the most, the, 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 the prime directive is to make things happen, right? And so one of the big challenges for government always has been, how do you take all of that energy and all that sort of drive that exists in the private sector and then channel it and turn it loose so that it serves public ends, uh, as opposed to public ends trying to sort of um, harness it or use it in ways that it's, uh, it's going to get frustrated with and, and required to. How do you see, I mean, you talk about the fact that things haven't really sort of moved in terms of AI, but my impression, David, Ari, correct me if I'm wrong, is there's a whole hell of a lot that's happening with AI in the in the private and the commercial sector. It's like it's like right. growing and growing like. There, there's a great deal happening. It's very hard to evaluate it. Uh, I've talked to a number of venture capitalists who are looking at the stream of proposals coming across their desks, and most of them involve uh, eliminating. Uh, secretaries and copy editors and things like that. That's the first generation. And they tend to dismiss yeah, that as hype. Banking on the street. I mean, just as an example, if you eliminated every help desk in every American corporation, I looked up the numbers from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, fired everybody, replaced them with a computer, you'd save $2 billion a year. We've added how many trillion dollars in market capitalization to companies based on AI? That doesn't quite... Handle it if you fire the bottom quarter of programmers and replace them with 
AI, that would save you $4 billion a year. So the kind of things which give you mass propagation of value creation, like the electric vehicle industry in China, uh, we haven't seen yet. We've basically mm -hmm. seen chipping away at services, at least in terms of the deal flow that I hear about from the venture capital community. So yes, there's a lot going on, but not the kind of thing that's going to transform the productivity of the U.S. economy, not yet. Here is our expert on the social consequences, right? <clears throat> sure. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I can speak to the, the kind of on-the-ground reality, but what I would like to do is try to offer some context for what it is that we're dealing with, what is AI. Um, I think one of the best uh, pieces of context that we can draw on, analogies that we can draw on, is the experience that we've just had with social media. Um, I offer this as an analogy because it was a transformative technology, uh, and I think its transformative power is minuscule compared to the, the possibility for AI. But let's think a little bit about what happened with social media. Um, one of the things you might have heard about social media and what happened to it as a, as a uh, social problem, a cultural problem, a political problem, is essentially people in charge were too stupid to figure it out. I think that's probably true, uh, but I also think that the people who best understood the nature of the technology were the most consequentially wrong about it. Uh, so the, the problems that you've heard about social media are probably things like disinformation and bias. You've heard about censorship problems with the, the speech algorithms, uh, the content moderation algorithms. Very recently, you might have heard something about uh, mental health um, and teenagers and children, mental health in particular. These, the social media as a paradigm is a, a almost frighteningly simple, I would say even a stupid technology. Uh, the two, in, in my mind, the two key attributes of social media are taking speech that used to happen in a lot of different places and concentrating it all into a single place or one or two places. So you had technologies in the 90s that could have been called social media. They were forums, online forums, where people go and post with a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand people. One of the most consequential things about social media was just that it put all of those people into a single forum. And you suddenly had people with all of these different ideas about uh, what it was that they were talking about, the nature of their speech that they were engaging in, what it was about. You would be talking to a friend and carrying on an internal joke at one moment, and the next moment, something you said would have been taken out of context and gone viral, and maybe you would have been canceled, or maybe you would have become some sort of new hero. You never knew. So uh, that, that one uh, feature, which is simply putting everyone into a single forum, there's nothing technically complicated about it. In fact, when you're building a social media platform, that's sort of the default way that you would do it. It's the simplest thing to do. But it's been hugely consequential, I think, in collapsing a lot of the contexts in which speech happens. A lot of the social media speech moderation problems are downstream from the fact that you have to apply a single standard to essentially 100 million people who are having 50 million different conversations. There's no single speech uh, moderation standard or even paradigm of what the, of what the problem is, of what the conversation is about that you can apply to 50 million conversations at once. Another feature that there's been in social media has been uh, the fact that most of the information you're seeing on social media by default is supplied to you by an algorithm rather than something straightforward like a, a timeline. So if you go and sign into Twitter, instead of seeing all of the people you follow in a reverse chronological order, you see an algorithmically generated feed where there's some opaque decision making that is happening that is deciding what you're seeing. Now, the technology that's deciding what you're seeing is very simple. It's very stupid, but it is very opaque. Somebody's making this decision for you. Uh, and one of the experiences that you have on, on social media is developing these, these senses of who is saying what. You develop a kind of paranoia. You have to proactively on social media because you'll see these people are talking about this, but these people are ignoring that. It's another, uh, it goes along with the problem of context collapse. These are two really simple, technically, uh, extremely simple features. There's really no reason they couldn't have been invented 40 or 50 years ago, other than the fact that you need these very large uh, data platforms to just scale them up in this way. But technologically, extremely simple. The consequences for American society and politics, it's touched on, on everything, right? You can say the last, at least the last three major presidential elections, maybe the last six, uh, have been, you can see how the dynamics have been shaped um, by the, the speech uh, patterns of social media. You can see it in journalism. Journalism has been transformed by social media, I think largely not for the better. Uh, 
Um, you hear about a loneliness epidemic right now, and yeah, you do hear about a teen mental health crisis. If you look at the charts on this, it's kind of looks like it started at the moment when there was a very large uptick in social media. All of the teenagers started having cell phones, smartphones in their pockets. And one of the things that that meant was that the, the social dynamics that are normally confined to going to school, uh, whether it's, it can be positive or negative, bullying, can be you know becoming top of your of your social paradigm it used to be that you would leave those things at school and then you would go home children would and they would have some wall surrounding that well that wall is gone and i think a lot of what's happening uh, a lot of the kind of sense of what's happening with the kids right now there's it's it must be related to what is happening on social media right we can wait for the social scientists to kind of hand that out there are some very persuasive arguments in particular that the huge rise in gender dysphoria has to do with what's been happening on social media and particularly on Tumblr, that it's been this engine for kind of creating Baroque lifestyles and advertising them to people as a, as a way to be. I've just sort of scratched the surface here. All of these things came from extremely technically simple things. And the people who technically understood them best would have had really no way to predict in advance that these things were going to happen. I think even in 2009, 2010, it would have been hard to, hard to predict those things. And of course, the people who were paying the most attention to it back then were the ones who were saying that it's going to change everything for the better, right? This is going to solve democracy. Now, transpose that over to AI, vastly, vastly more technically complicated. I'm going to, I realize I'm going on. I want to try to provide a brief little piece to explain what AI is. I actually worked briefly at an AI company called Psycorp. Uh, it was the first and only company of its kind that was trying to explicitly encode all human knowledge. One of the examples that they gave me uh, back at five years ago, 10 years ago, if you, you could ask Google simple questions and it would give you answers. If you asked it how tall was John F. Kennedy, it would give you a correct answer, six foot one, I think. If you asked it a question like how tall was the president when John F. Kennedy was born, it would answer 500 feet, which is the altitude of the town where John F. Kennedy was born. It was doing very, very simple association. That number existed on a web page somewhere and it was the likeliest match. The creator of PsyCorp explained that what Google was doing was giving you, uh, it, it knew 2 billion facts about the world, and so it could give you 2 billion answers. PsyCorp was attempting to understand the relationship between these things, and it did so reasonably successfully. Uh, what its creator said was, we know about 100,000 facts about the world, and we can tell you infinitely many things about the world because we can recombine them in new ways. And it's infinitely extensible how you can recombine those. It's the same relationship, basically, that you have to reading a book. When you open a book, there's a finite number of facts that are in there. When you absorb them into your mind, you begin to reconfigure them in a completely unbounded way. Well, that is what essentially the new paradigm of generative AI is able to do. PsyCorp did it with an enormous amount of manpower and it was still limited. The new generation is able to do it in a very cheap and simple way. It recombines across a large number of paradigms. It's not just text, it's also images. They're able to reprocess. Uh, there's an example where um, they set up a camera that could measure radio waves and they were able to detect people in another room just by measuring the way that Wi-Fi signals were modulated through people's bodies passing through the wall and were able to do this in, I think it was a few hours or a couple of days of programming. So the number of different paradigms and the number of different applications that that could touch on is, it's essentially unbounded. It makes predicting what's going to happen phenomenally difficult, I think. But in the assembling and reassembling language that we're used to, it seems to me, it seems to other people that there is some kind of moral valiance built in. Uh, would you like to say a few words, whether you think there is one, whether you detect one, and maybe Jody, you can comment on this too. Yeah, of course there is one. There, there inevitably is one. Uh, we were discussing this a little bit earlier. I, you know, to me, it reads as a kind of bland uh, you submitted a letter to a, a corporation with a complaint, maybe something that you experienced as a consumer, maybe about something socially they're doing, and you get back a very polished, dry thing with a lot of talk about responsibility that doesn't really mean anything. It's that kind of vibe that you're getting when you're interacting with ChatGPT. It's clearly, I think, a, uh, I would say it's a left-leaning one. I wouldn't exactly call it woke. I would call it very sanitized and attempting to uh, evade offending anyone and to, uh, to fulfill various shibboleths. Jody, I'm curious your perspective. Uh, you know, the moral implications of the computer revolution have been insufficiently analyzed. Um, they are profound, but we don't know what they are. At least, certainly having reached any kind of cultural decision about that. I do not know anyone of any seriousness of thought 
who defend social media. Everyone I know of any intelligence despises it and its social effects, and yet we seem incapable of escaping it. No government can legislate against this. No parent groups of any seriousness are saying no computers till you're 17. This is, you know, despite all of the information that we have. And the fact, as I say, that you will not, I believe, encounter a serious person who says, yes, let's int introduce our 13-year-old girls to social media. Uh, you will find no one of any weight saying that, and yet we are incapable of doing anything about it because these moral questions about the computer revolution haven't been solved. AI is going to aggravate our indecision about these. Marshall McLuhan, actually, a curious moment in an interview with Frank Kermode, the literary critic, this was a name to conjure with once upon a time. Uh, in an interview in 1965 with Frank Kermode, uh, Marshall McLuhan, you know, was over boomed and then under boomed and is sort of, we're now reaching a decision about him, sort of medium. Uh, Marshall McLuhan suggested that the virtues enshrined as rights in the Bill of Rights were the virtues of readers. They were the privacy, they were the free speech, free thought. These were virtues that you were needed if you were going to be a person who absorbs facts and information and decides what they think about things through the relatively slow mechanism of the And that the nomadic tribe that wanders around seeing visual information passing at enormous rates ends up having to use myth to process that information. And he suggested that we would see with the rise of television and of course the computers, a return to memes and myth-making, and we would see people beginning to understand or not understand why they needed certain rights, which were essentially enlightenment protections for the kind of decision-making and thinking that readers needed. I don't know if he's right, but it is a line that I think you want to pursue if you're going to think about the ethical here. And it's certainly showing up, it seems to me, or at least evidence that he might be right, with the massive decline among the most computer educated, which are our younger generations, of support for free speech. Um, that suggests that McLuhan might, be, might well be right, that the way we absorb information when it comes to us in this, this wave of visual information off the web um, is not entirely compatible or doesn't seem reasonable. Um, with these, with the relatively slow absorption and presentation of material, which is the printed form. Uh, that kind of ethical discourse is profoundly needed, and we have not undertaken it, despite the fact that we are over 40 years into the computer revolution. AI is now this new uh, thing that's coming along. I think it promises great things, but it also promises dangers, just as uh, Ari told us. And one thing, to bring us back to our actual topic today, one thing you can count on is if there are bad social uses of a new technology, China is going to pursue them. Uh, we're going to see social control like you would not believe, thanks to AI, in China. And I fear that there will be a race to the bottom among other countries because of the interconnectivity, which is... Uh, brought to us by the second wave of the computer revolution, which was the internet, and the third wave, as David mentioned, which was the cell phone. By the way, China currently forbids people under 18 from spending more than two hours a week on online games. And since you require facial recognition to log on to the internet, there is no way to hack that. Uh, I think that's an excellent idea. We should adopt it here. <laughs> Returning to China, uh, Arthur, you said that uh, China plus AI is an existential threat. Uh, does AI add something? Was China before not an existential threat? What, what exactly is it? You began to oh, talk about that a little before. Yeah, yeah, I, I, think, yeah I, think, I think AI gives them, and particularly the way in which they envision it, and the way in which it would be employed, whether it's on the battlefield, in the, in, in the industrial plant, in the manufacturing plant, or in a form of, a con of total control of the government over its, over its citizens, um, 
all of these, I think, spring from the set of values that animate the Chinese Communist Party, and they would be the case with whatever technology right, comes to their hands. AI just happens to be the one that caught President Xi's eye and others, um, and which has, uh, because of its... Uh, <coughs> Because of the, the, its pervasiveness, and and by pervasiveness I mean the fact that it's a technology which is now proliferated everywhere, right? It's so easy to build an AI application and a program. Now all the tools are there. You can learn how to do it online. Uh, the toolkits are all freely available in all these in, in various ways, and also again because um, particularly in its black box forms. We don't really know how why the machine is reaching the conclusions it does. You can't reconstruct that process, and that makes that that makes it particularly scary. And I think, that to a degree, uh, what what we have with China in regard to AI and, and this relationship, which has developed in American eyes and Western eyes, is is that is the intimidation factor of the technology itself. Uh, and I think in thinking about why is it the government has moved so slowly? Why has it come in these very sort of stovepiped ways with each of the different departments, right, of the government sort of setting aside a portion of their budget every year to work on AI applications? Where's the overall national strategy? Where's the sense? Well, the national strategy depends upon, I think, to a large degree of self-confidence that if you adopt such a strategy, you will prevail, and I don't really get the sense of that here in the United States or in the West when it comes to a technology like this. I think in the case of China, you very much do. There's a feeling like, yeah, there's this great tool that we can use in order to extend and develop global hegemony, the goal that we've had all along. Um, and I think for, for Americans and for the West generally, the AI still remains a very much of a of a mysterious, enigmatic type of technology. We haven't really sort of grasped the way in which it really can be an extension of, an extension of mainstream values, the values that we would hold dear as part of a democracy, uh, the, the, the enlightenment values that, that Jody was talking about. We haven't quite seen a way clear as to how they can be an extension of that instead of being a threat. And I think that that poses a certain degree of paralysis. A couple of quick factoids just to, to extend ex your point, which I entirely agree with. One is the simple truth is that the United States is far ahead of China at the highest levels of theory about uh, AI and about um, computer scientists' practice. Of it. This is still the home of it. Uh, Europe's catching up. China's catching up, but right now, this is the home of theory of AI. This Same with AI. quantum computing. Right. Uh, <clears throat> but there is what, what President Griffiths mentioned, that there's this manpower problem. Um, and it comes from the fact that, remember, I opened by saying one of the key changes in the last year and a half was the lowering of entry level scale into AI, both in terms of finance and in terms of the level of your computer science in order to deploy it. Uh, where it used to be that only the top scientists with millions and millions of dollars of funding could do anything with AI. Now, second, third tier engineers can do something for a lot less money. That's the big reason that we're having a panel like this, why we're all thinking about AI right now. But also, this, address, this brings up the manpower problem, which is, yeah, we may have the best computer scientists in the world and the aggregate, and that's why people come here to study. But we're also producing our engineering schools are in horrendous shape. The number of engineering and science and math uh, graduates that we're producing is really nothing compared to China's. And, and without the foreign students, right. they would all collapse. Right. And They'd be also, I mean, we see this at Dakota State. We need those foreign students to, to keep our budgets up. Uh, this is a really serious thing. And at the same time, you get, you know, an American experience. We have seen this with, particularly with the 40-year effort to increase women's participation in the STEM fields, mm -hmm. as, 
that engineering still is second only to theoretical physics in the number of women who go into it. That despite a cultural investment in producing women in these fields, the likes of which would shock you if we could actually add up all the numbers over the past 40 years, we don't respond well to top-down directives of the kind that the Chinese do. And this is going to be a problem when, as I say, AI now is capable of being done by merely well-educated computer scientists instead of the geniuses of computer science. The question is, where's the constraint? As I said, there, this is a tripod. There are three elements. One is the computing power. You need the chips, which can process a lot of data. Secondly, you need the software. Thirdly, you need the data. The data may become by far the most important constraint. If there's easy entry into the software, you, you get the toolkit off the internet or how it will sell you its do-it-yourself system, that certainly is less of a constraint, as Jody said, is that, than it used to be, and that may continue to decline. The hardware, well, we've seen that Gina Raimondo was deeply disturbed by the fact that China can produce a domestic a seven nanometer chip. I'm deeply disturbed that she's deeply disturbed. <laughs> uh, but I think it's unlikely that in terms of U.S.-China competition, raw hardware power is going to be a decisive data. It's the old uh, fr frequent meme that uh, China is the Saudi Arabia of data. But if you want to train, uh, if you want the machine to learn how to make a machine, how to pick a defective part off the conveyor belt or how to do preventive maintenance, you need a very large number of data points. You, uh, you may need to train a machine on 20,000 daily instances. And as an engineer at uh, Bosch told me, there are two ways you could do it. You could wait for 20,000 days, that's a bit over 50 years, or you can get data from 50,000 machines. If you already have a huge installed base of machines, China now has 10 times as many industrial robots as the United States. And in fact, more industrial robots per industrial worker than we do, a greater density. You can have a snowball effect in which China's advantage in data allows it to implement systems faster, which then give it all the more data. So without producing in scale, without scaling up systems, we will be dependent on Chinese data. We already are on biotech. There's not a single pharma company in the world that doesn't have a big research team doing AI and drug development in China because they've got the biggest data set on patient histories. There's no privacy laws. Uh, and that can be true for many other industries. So without scaling up across the board, there's no single thing that we can do that's going to give us a decisive advantage over China. I, I'd like to jump in. I, I completely agree with you. The, the data are going to be very important. It's why China was able to really move ahead with machine learning because it had this surveillance state and everybody was using a cell phone and they were gathering all the information, what, what everyone was doing, um, and definitely have had a lead in, in that area. But I also want to turn it the other way around. Um, I am increasingly concerned about, I mean, I know we, we say it, misinformation, deliberate malign information from other countries, not just China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, et cetera. And if you look at the data available more generally for the kind of data that uh, just fine for teaching large language models how to speak and how to, how to uh, generate uh, speech and text, but not so good for finding accurate information. And the, the projection is there's so much misinformation now um, out on the web um, that one of the big issues that I am concerned about for us all and, and young people in particular is are we going to be able to discern what's the real, what's real, what's authentic from what's artificial and what's being created and deliberately provided to us in order to create chaos in our society? Because we are becoming, in a way, increasingly chaotic with what we're having to deal with. So more data is not always good. It's which data we have? And I just, I, I worry about... Um, um, you were talking about the deliberate um, cognitive manipulation. One of my concerns I have is, what about the young brain 
young developing brain that we already know the TV had an impact on, right. social media has had an impact on, and now artificial intelligence is like yeah. just some food for thought. <clears throat> and then you also the other issue you just touched on, the, the problem of the deep fakes, right? And how you distinguish even images which seem empirically true, that's that person speaking, and they're using their words and using it's that face, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, it's a complete, uh, completely artificially generated at the same time. You know, though, I'm going to say something else. I, I feel that all of these, all these issues are perfectly valid and, and the concerns about, about what the limitations are with AI. And yet, I really feel that there's a deeper issue here. And that is, is that here in America, I think we have a leadership in so many areas who've just really lost confidence in themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that part of developing a national AI strategy of any kind of national strategy is a feeling of confidence that, that things will be better if the strategy succeeds. And I just don't know if that's the case. In other words, let's roll this back. Suppose we were having this, we had this sort of national debate or your national security commission, et cetera. If that were taking place in 1953, right, instead of 2023, what the difference in the attitude would be. There would be people there who would fully understand how important and vital it was for the American way of life, for America and the free world to triumph. You would have people like Edward Teller who would be on the commission, who would be telling you about don't worry about the ill effects of this technology of AI and machine learning because we'll handle it. We know how to do this right and that the link between science and technology and our national security and national defense institutions is so strong, is so robust, and so rooted in what's really important in the world that we know that we'll be able to prevail against our opponent, Soviet Union, uh, in all of these things, because they, in the end, represent the realm of evil and we represent the realm of good. I don't get that sense at all from leadership right now. And it's not one, <laughs> it's definitely not one taught in colleges and universities outside of a few exceptions, like Hillsdale. It's definitely not something which I think uh, permeates uh, either social media or mainstream media or, or any of the, of the larger culture institutions that we have right now. And I think that also encourages a kind of paralysis in the face of technologies here of not being able to decide simply this is right and this is wrong. This is, this we can't do and this, this, this we shouldn't do. And I think that, that, that the challenge that precisely that Ari brought up with regard to social media also applies to AI may have its roots in that, in that particular. And, and let Ari jump in. I think he has a, the, just, just to add to this, the there's, there, there's a considerably less and less trust as you see uh, in the government, especially since COVID. And there I think is a, a big base uh, in the country that uh, wouldn't want to overturn uh, to the federal government, such a thing that has that could have such consequences. All right, please. Yeah, you, you jumped ahead of me. I wanted to, to say, uh, you know, part of the point that I was trying to make about social media, the takeaway from that was not supposed to be doom and gloom. Uh, the point is uh, to try to find out what's the underlying uh, value or social structure that is going to be challenged by the technology. Um, I think that there are two that we can point to. Uh, one is institutional legitimacy, the relationship between people and government and other key institutions, and also questions of meaning and purpose. We've been talking about a, a grand strategy, you know, the question, national grand strategy for AI, even a national grand strategy against China. Does the average American have any idea of what that would even mean? What would, what would be the purpose of a strategic competition against China in general, to say nothing of against China over AI? I don't think most people You'd have any idea. You'd look for the answers on your TikTok, right? Sure, wouldn't That's you? That's right. The first thing you would be looking at. So well, I think... In 53, we'd ask the RAND Corporation to take care of it. So, so to, uh, specifically, you know, uh, you mentioned the concern about misinformation. That's actually not one that I'm so worried about already because that's a problem we already have. It's a problem that goes back more or less to the printing press, right? That was one of the big problems early on after the printing press was that there were all of these crazy messianic pamphlets being printed right. Um, vastly crazier, more mind-bending stuff than you find even on the, the darkest recesses of Twitter. It was awful for, you know, 100 years. It probably fomented wars of religious, uh, wars of religion. It probably played a significant role in that. 
And eventually it was figured out. And the way that it was figured out was uh, new models for relationship to institutions and institutional legitimacy. There's, there's one specific example here that I want to offer. There are states in the United States where if you are uh, potentially standing trial, you've been found guilty of a crime, say shoplifting or robbery or something like that. Uh, there are now algorithms that play a very significant role that even more or less decide whether or not you're going to go to jail for that or whether you're going to get uh, pre-trial diversion, probation, basically. Um, now, the reason that these algorithms have been put into place, uh, you know, somebody thought they could make some money on it, but the main reason really is that there was already a crisis of trust in the justice system about whether the justice system can decide fairly, and especially whether the justice system can decide fairly if it's going to treat white people the same as black people, right? Now, what's wound up happening with that algorithm is that there have been all of these investigative reports that have shown actually it's perpetuating the biases that were already there in the system. The disparate uh, sentencing rates are now reflected in the data. There was a, an article on this from Pro, ProPublica. But if you look into this, it's impossible to close that gap. Um, there are different ways that you can define what count as disparities in criminal sentencing. If you have disparities in the data that's being drawn upon, and the main data source is how often people have been sentenced previously, it's provably mathematically impossible to eliminate that gap in terms of these algorithms. It's going to come up in some way or another. So what has happened with this algorithm is that it took what was really a problem of, I would say, of legitimacy, right? And it misinterpreted it as a procedural problem, a problem of fairness. And I think it further entrenched and worsened that problem by outsourcing the problem from human judges who are making these decisions to computers. And the thought that that would increase people's trust in the system. And actually, it's decreased their trust. It's gone along with a, a general decrease, decrease in trust. I think there are a lot of ways that you can imagine AI, uh, that being the AI future, right, is basically all of the things, essentially what it's doing is it's exporting political cost. It's politically costly to have human judges make these decisions because they have to bear the brunt of the anger when they make a, a mistake. They get voted out. It's politically costly for uh, politicians to make decisions. We see all of these ways in which people in, in these positions of authority are now trying to outsource those decisions, right? During COVID, we saw that outsourcing with, well, I'm not making the decision. The scientists are doing this. That's uh, institutionally speaking, in terms of institutional trust, that's equivalent to just having a machine do it. It's saying we're having these people do it and they're not acting as people. They're just acting as machines who are processing data. If that's the AI future, if that's the paradigmatic way, the main way that AI is used, I think we will see a greater deepening of the crises that we've seen. However, you can imagine lots of other uh, lots of other emphases, lots of other ways. I can try to piece together some story about how it is used to uh, advance a story of, uh, of American meaning and purpose, uh, new economic activity. I think that it will be almost certainly a revolution in economics. It's probably not right now, but it will be at some point. Um, so that question of the story uh, in which it is happening, what is the underlying meaning of this technology? I think that's the one that we need to be asking. Um, and I think it is in important ways actually up to us to determine. It's not just us looking at this and saying what we see. It's something we can actually decide upon. We enter here, Harry, um, field into I mean, cyber ethics, into a field that I've been thinking about for the past few years. Um, Heather Wilson, a uh, friend of ours who um, was secretary of the Air Force uh, for a while, um, gave a, a very interesting lecture. I think na the National Interest published uh, afterwards, she came out to us at Dakota State and gave this lecture. And she analyzed the computer revolution in its relationship to war and using the tool of just war theory. And she said, you know, in the juice in bellum, in the actual practice of war, in the things we do in war, which is one of the arms of just war theory, um, we see that the, the computer revolution has brought us advances. She was suspicious of the term precision weapon because in fact, in warfare, there's nothing that's precise. But she said, generally speaking, look what we've done. We no longer bomb entire cities like Dresden, firebomb them in the hopes of destroying two ball bearing factories. Uh, we, we have instantaneous communications and there's always, in the Air Force, there's always a JAG lawyer there in the decision, because we can have time for that in this current thing. In the actual practice of war, that arm, just war theory, we have seen an advance in moral reasoning, moral applications in the practice of war, 
thanks to the computer of her worry was about that's spoken like hour. a like an Air Force right secretary yeah because she was just where you definitely see <laughs> see the impact of that right her worry in the second arm the second arm is the juice Abel arm the justice at for war what are the valid reasons for going for war we you know we see this badly deployed by those in a current situation or calling for proportionality. Proportionality is one of the segments of that jus ad bellum arm of just war theory, applied by those who maybe don't know it that well. Um, but she said, what happens when you have AI analysis of world events based on a huge number of data points, and it says closing the Straits of Hermuz is a requires going to war? It says something like that. Your AI says something like that. You can't interrogate it. It's a black box pattern recognition. What do you say? And we'd say, well, this is why we want a human in the loop somewhere, except Ari has just pointed us to the great problem of the person in the loop, which is the avoidance of responsibility. The CYA the attempt, problem. Right, the attempt to push it off. Yeah. I, you, you encounter this when there's a charge on your credit card and you can't figure out what it is, and you call them up, and you get some person who says, well, it's our policy, right? That's that attempt to push off onto an algorithm, moral responsibility. It is a- To keep you from ever seeing the face of your accuser, as it, it were. It is a profound yeah. problem that Max Weber pointed out in his analysis of bureaucracy so long ago, that it is the substitution of a deontology, a system of rules, for a teleology, uh, for a system that has a purpose, that bureaucracies always transform the teleological into the deontological. They always want to reduce it to a rule set. And AI becomes this way in which the human could say, well, I didn't really want to send our submarines to the Straits of Hermuz, but the computer told us to. And that was her worry. It seems to me that as AI advances, as it becomes cheaper and more easily deployed, that we are going to see exactly this problem again and again magnified in which the moral response of human beings is always going to be this attempt to step back from responsibility. And we're going to see a lot of this going on, particularly, it seems to me, among those who um, you know, are most in charge of deploying it. I wanted to make one other quick point, Arthur, which is this failure of will, this failure of self-confidence, um, this sense of decline, you need to come out to us in South Dakota. You need to see that it's not uniform across this nation. There is a sense out in middle America. I realize South Dakota, to most of you, is the wilds in the end of the world. Right? No, but, North Dakota is. Well, <laughs> that North is Dakota. true. There's sure, my no, family's there's from. no more difference between North Dakota and South Dakota than there is between, say, North Korea and South Korea. <laughs> uh, but, but you do need to get a sense that outside of the Twitter chatter, outside of the coastal agitations, um, there is still a confidence that this country has a historical horizon and is heading somewhere. Now, whether they are capable of, in these days of Donald Trump and Joe Biden, whether they're capable of producing electoral officials who manifest that is an entirely other question. But I do think the kind of sense of what are we for, we lack any idea of what we're for, that's less uniform across this country than you might believe. Well, what is, what is that term, sense in South Dakota? I think I use the term leadership when I was talking particularly about that. But you may, I think, I think your point is taken. I'm going to disagree a little bit with Heather Wilson, with all due respect, though. And that is, is that I think, I think the, the example that she chooses there is, is, is rather an extreme one. If you look at the way in which the Defense Department is looking to use AI. Now, it's not to make decisions about whether we go to war or not. It's at a much lower level of decision making. And, and the key is, is, to, is to present as not just a single option of what to be done, but also a number of options that are available based upon how the information comes across here. Um, you know, if you're in the, if you're in the military, if you're involved with this uh, in any degree, you have a lot of talk about what's called the, um, the OODA loop, which is that uh, human action moves according to a loop of observation, orientation, decision, action, right? We know we're in a room, observation, 
orientation. It's a it's a fascinating panel that's speaking on AI um, with a with a with an audience here. Decision: I need to go sit up closer so I can hear even more of the of the words of wisdom that are coming across from the panel. And then action: you go and sit in the chair. And the key to victory in current DoD doctrine has been for for a long time. The key is to be able to close the loop faster than your opponent. In other words, to be able to orient yourself to make a decision about what to do in a given conflict situation and then to act upon that faster than he can and, to, and then to orient yourself the next step. It's a series of loops, right? The key for AI is to, is to provide for you a quicker way to arrive at, the at a decision by giving you the orientation you need and then the choices that are available for you in that kind of situation. Not necessarily to simply simply say, here's the option, this is what you must do. The, the key is to leave, and here I, here's, here's what, what I was getting at. The key is still that it's in the hand of the squad commander, the battalion commander, and so on, to make a decision. Pentagon is moving at what they call decision-centric warfare. Of, of decentralizing the command structure in ways that uh, you can respond more quickly to changes on the battlefield or in a given situa kinetic situation so that, so that lower and lower ranks can, or uh, command structure can make, make key decisions. I think we can't go away from the issue about ethics and AI, though, without talking about the Project Maven, don't you think? I mean, this is one that I'm sure even members, some of you in the audience must know about too. And this was the project that was launched by DOD uh, to develop a, uh, an AI application. It was a facial and visual recognition program that would allow uh, you to identify um, terrorists and then to use autonomous systems, drones, uh, to be able to use that system to then target and take out terrorists. And the company that they approached to do this was Google. Google knows a lot about AI, knows a lot about um, the, the kind, these kinds of pattern recognition programs, machine learning, it's their stuff, right? Well, there was a revolt by Google employees who said, we will not participate in this program, we want nothing to do with it. To which it was pointed out by the DOD people, this is a program for identifying terrorists. In other words, what we're doing is finding out people, bad people who are trying to kill us and trying to kill them beforehand. And the Google employees were still unwilling to participate in that program. And eventually program, Project Maven had to be dropped because their key contractor, Google, had simply ground to a halt, wasn't able to do anything, wasn't able to move forward with this. I think that is the kind of, if you like, ethical dilemma and issue which is going to be encountered more and more when we come to the application of AI and machine learning onto the battlefield. L less of the machine running away with itself, right, and blowing up things. And I tried to stop it, and it just wouldn't, it wouldn't stop, or making kill decisions, uh, uh, crucial decisions in the kill chain that should be left to human beings, but rather of technicians, those working on things, objecting strenuously to the applications of that technology um, in ways that even in the case of killing terrorists was simply a ethically a bridge too far for those Google employees. Think I'm wrong? Do you think we're not in going not going to encounter more of those kinds of things as we go forward? No, I, I think we will. I think we will because we haven't dealt with the issues. That's, that's the point. So we're going to have to face them again and again and again. Um, I want to bring up one other point, um, if I could, and that's the, um, the relationship um, between artificial intelligence as it currently is evolving and cybersecurity. I think they are intimately related. If you're going to rely on data sets, especially live data, you want to make sure that the data are sort of unfiddled with and, and data poisoning is, is, is rife in critical applications relating to our critical, critical infrastructures. Um, I, so I see the need to protect the AI data streams and the AI models at the same time 
we can be using AI to actually analyze the kinds of signals that we're seeing sure. that are coming into attack. So all the way while I was on the National Security Commission, I would say, what about cyber? Because that's our, my background with AI. And I would say, no, no, cyber's different. But really? right at the end, they, are you came, kidding back, me? they came back to it. They came back to <laughs> I'm it. I'm so surprised. They, it was, I felt I should have a little flag at every meeting. Cyber, don't forget it. It's, it the two, I think, are intimately related. I don't think you can develop any kind of digital technology today, whether in the industrial sector or in the in the in the in the in the defense sector commercial sector without first and foremost thinking about the security aspects right from the beginning I, from the very the start fact. from this, the very this start. is a point we have not made and and president griffiths brings us to it and seems to me that we need to say for everybody to recognize this fact that born of the computer revolution specifically in its digital uh, or its interconnectivity ai offers its greatest benefits and its greatest dangers to that interconnectivity, to the computerized data sets, to the computerized world. That's where its changes are going to be taking place most obviously, and most, maybe not most obviously, but most pervasively. And that's where its greatest threats are in terms of breaking computer security, you know, by being able to see patterns that we don't. It's actually in the digital world that made AI possible that we're going to see the biggest effect of AI, of AI, both for good and for ill. Right, and what about the privacy issue too? When you're thinking about those massive reams of data that machine learning programs require in order to, to do, their, do their stuff, um, where's that data being pulled from? And uh, uh, who is it? And this is why we're always surprised, aren't we? When people get so frustrated or worried about government access to your data when Commercial companies have access to much more and make much more use of it, including offensive use of that data than government has ever conceived of or wanted to do here as well. But privacy and security, these are issues that are going to have going to impinge very much on how AI is going to apply. But it's also ones in which AI is going to be applied in order to address them. Right. Now, before we turn it over to audience questions, does anybody have uh, any real disagreement with one another? <laughs> Unimaginable. Someone pick a fight. Uh, <laughs> questions? The microphone is coming around to you. I heard some uh, conversation about. AI's advent, uh, advantage in, in, in the industrial plant. And I heard we talked about China and the United States. China is going to lose 600 million people by 2050. <laughs> so my question is, does the AI and the top-down advantage of China and its use, is that going to offset the loss of population? Uh, well, there are th three things you can do if your workforce is declining. One is you can, Im you can get immigrants, which China probably won't. The second is you can increase productivity. And the third is you can export capital and hire young workers in other places where they are. Uh, China is well aware of its population issues. And one of the reasons it's committed so much resources to what it calls the fourth industrial revolution, that's the World Economic Forum's uh, for what it's worth, the acronym or the application of AI to, uh, to industry is to increase productivity. Uh, there are certainly very large productivity gains to be had, and the demo, what China has is a handful of really good demo pro uh, uh, projects, which might be called proofs of concept. Even more important in the long run may be China's export of capital and its integration of workers in the global south into its sphere. It's what I called sino-forming uh, in my book. So China's, China now exports more to the global south than it does to all industrial markets. It's the dominant provider of both physical and digital infrastructure. And its objective is to create a long-term permanent market, a set of investments, which effectively hardwire very large numbers of people, perhaps billions, into the Chinese economic sphere. And 
it's not just China's own workers who become more productive, it's China's ability to exploit the productivity of workers outside China by the use of Chinese technology, uh, which China hopes to compensate for declining population. Uh, can this happen? Well, the Koreans reduced their workforce drastically between, say, 2000 and 2010, uh, but they increased industrial production four times over. So they actually had a five-fold increase in productivity. Though it has been done, uh, it's not impossible to do it in a small economy like Korea is one thing to do it in an economy of 1.4 billion is a bigger challenge. Uh, I don't know whether they'll succeed, but that uh, the, the Belt and Road Initiative and all the trillion dollar investments in infrastructure around the world are part of the same plan as their AI so-called fourth industrial revolution plan. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I wanted to thank the panel. It was a, a marvelous presentation. It was a, very erudite and, and very helpful. My interest is, would take us perhaps in an, a direction you may not want to go, but uh, I think many of us have heard the story of, of Tom Hanks and the, the events that he had with a, a dental plan that was uh, put out in advertising in which he had absolutely no involvement. He had absolutely no consent to it. He had, uh, it was done completely without his permission. And yet, by the technology, it seemed that this was something that was of his creation. And I wonder if you have a reflection at that level, at a more macro level, that, that uh, this technology has the ability to impact our daily lives in very profound ways, whether we're being made to say something that we didn't say or being portrayed to do things that we haven't done. I mean, Eric could speak about this, I, I think, quite well. I will say that the faking of uh, presence as father were um, present before AI became affordable. We were doing this, you know, from just with algorithmic programming uh, before. And, you know, there are recourses for people like Tom Hanks who have enough money to pursue suits under the laws which currently exist about, you know, protection of self-identity and, and <coughs> of, of your rights and so on. A AI is going to make that easier. But I think this is not a problem that we won't figure out. It seems to me, and relatively rapidly. You know, it took us a long time. I, I remember in the 90s, Bill Gates or somebody at Microsoft saying that um, the percentage of email that was spam was somewhere around 80%, right? That 80% of the email traffic of the world was spam. Um, and we, we eventually kind of figured it out. You know, we, you know, you stop your inbox stopped being filled with Viagra ads uh, at some point. We, we kind of worked it out. Seems to me that, that those are practical problems which AI might actually help us with, that AI might turn out to be good at identifying AI-generated fakes. Uh, and so this kind of stuff is not <coughs> actually what worries me. Now, you have to understand, I, I like AI. I'm actually interested in its advance and some of the great stuff that can come from it. Um, there are worries. Seems to me those what you're describing is not a worry, but a growing pain um, that will be taken care of as the stuff is going. Are you with that? That sounds right to me. I mean, I would say of the problems that AI is going to raise, that is the most figure outable uh, because you can adopt countermeasures almost as fast as the problem can be created. And it's also fairly easy to define what that is and to create legislation around it, right? You could say that there's a I mean, image likeness rights already do exist. Uh, you might only need to modify them a little bit. Um, it does remind me, though, of the, the question that was raised earlier about um, misinformation and fakes. I'm, I, I worry more about what might happen in a very fast-moving uh, news situation, right? Like when the, when the war broke out a couple of weeks ago in the Middle East, 
I, I was stealing myself to see something that seemed very persuasive and turned out to be a fake. That didn't happen, but I think that that sort of thing is going to happen soon. So the crisis situations are more of a problem. But by and large, the question that interests me most is what are the, the, um, what are the processes and the norms by which we adjudicate true and false claims, right? Why was it that we had such a problem during COVID, for example? There was tons of misinformation proliferating then, and it didn't really take very sophisticated technology to do it. Um, I think that there were two factors going on there. One was you did have a technological revolution that made the discovery of facts vastly cheaper than it was before, and therefore the assembling of narratives around whatever facts you needed to suit your, your point, right? If you wanted to make the point that masks always work and everybody should wear them until the end of time, or that they're a total fraud and they don't do anything, there was mountains of information available for you to, to make either of those points, because it was act, it's actually a fairly ambiguous question. Um, and finding that and assembling it was vastly easier than it had ever been before. The other problem, and I think the more significant <coughs> one, is who are you hearing this from and do you trust them, right? I don't think the CDC probably, I think the CDC did a lot of lying to people during COVID. I also think it had been lying to people for a long time in a sort of similar way. And it was just more noticeable during that, that moment. Now, I haven't looked, but I suspect if I looked back at the 50s or the 60s or something like that, I would probably find about a similar pattern. I haven't had a motivation to do that. A lot of other people haven't either because we had a relationship of trust to the CDC then, and it just didn't show up in the same way. Or to the extent it was happening, it wasn't as much of a problem. I think that the misinformation problem is downstream from the fact that we don't really have trusted authorities we can go to anymore. There isn't the CDC. I don't think that there are going to be national institutions that serve that same role in the near future. A lot of people don't have a trusted pastor uh, or school leader that they can go to. Um, those are the questions that I think are going to determine how these things in a, uh, these problems as raised by AI play out. And that's the one that's the most interesting to me. A lot of those trends of alienation are themselves technological in a very different sense that doesn't have to do with social media. They have to do with centralization and a lot of economic forces and regulatory forces that have concentrated brain drain in a few cities that have concentrated jobs in the service industry. That's why you have a lot of uh, competition for housing in the big cities and a lot of flight from smaller places. I think that the misinformation problem is in some ways downstream from that social and cultural one. So the interesting question to me is, is AI going to accelerate that trend of that kind of alienation and loneliness um, and separation from institutions, or is it going to reverse it? Should I have no idea what the answer to that question is. Chat GPT or these other chat bots, um, which, you know, to reiterate President Griffith's line, that's easy, right? You get to make these. Um, they are aggravated. They're the most visible use right now. Our students are all using it and so on. That's the most visible use of AI that currently exists. Um, you know, we're going to see much bigger things, but that's what's, what's in the air right now. Yeah, they can write poems. <laughs> well, yeah. That's right. <laughs> uh, <it's> <laughs> oh, sacred bars. <laughs> um, but, they, but what I wanted to say is chat GPT and these others are aggravating the problem because they are doing word association, basically, um, and gathering words that were near other words in the vast panoply, which is the web, which is filled with a whole lot of misinformation, which is filled with bad sources. You know, we think if I want to know, um, you know, I don't know who wrote Shakespeare's son, <coughs> um, and I go read Delia and all the nutballs over the years who have thought that that it was uh, Joe Sobrin wrote a surprisingly good book, actually, uh, claiming that it was Sydney. You know, I mean, you, you can go on and, and find these. But I would also read the premier scholars of this. There was a handful of people that I would accept as kind of authoritative, both for and against it, and I would use them as my data set. ChatGBT goes out and gathers everything and then does word association. And there's a whole lot of bad information out there. And it doesn't know. It's all equal. It's the expert and the idiot uh, uh, but, are, are equal for ChatGBT. But, but can't it weight the information by the number of papers cited in the professional journals? Well, that issues in Arya's problem of, of trust in these social or in these science journals. But also I wanted to say, here's a really good example. Lawyers have already been disciplined in two states, Minnesota and Wisconsin, I believe, although I'm a little iffy on Wisconsin, for filing briefs written for them by ChatGPT, which made up cases. 
you know, and research papers are starting to do this. And the, you know, finally, the defense or the, the other side in this civil trial says, we have searched and searched and we can't find these cases that you're citing. They were really <laughs> reluctant to say they don't exist. Right? The court looked into it and these lawyers have been called up before the bar for filing briefs and legal documents in front of a judge inventing cases. And their defense was, well, I asked ChatGPT to write it for me. Uh, and this is a sort of great example of what ChatGPT can do. I've mentioned in other contexts um, that for those of you who are teaching, you demand an independent citation for any work quoted in your and one of your students' papers. So that's the simplest way to solve this, is to say, okay, in ChatGPT gave you this, I want you to go out on the web and find out if it actually exists. Uh, but this is a great example of this kind of insouciance with which these chatbots are simply gathering words. They can't tell what's a good source and what isn't. So for now, at least, the most visible use of AI for the American public is in fact aggravating the problem that Ari pointed us to. Further questions? Uh, Murray. Just a quick clarification. Is ChatGPT generative AI or not? Because yes, it, it, it strikes me as indistinguishable from machine learning in that it's crunching all of this text and then on the basis of probabilities, regurgitating things. And it, I mean, we know it writes fiction, right? Because it invents things that don't exist. Uh, but none of it is true, right? So is there a artificial intelligence that is capable of genuine discovery, which is, which is a criteria that I would have to use the word generative, that can actually make something new as opposed to just simply discovering signals in the noise, many of those signals being merely phantoms? I think ChatGPT is that. Uh, I've been you know, offering the negative here. I use it all, off, all the time in my work. I actually have coding projects that I still do, uh, despite my, my role. It can write code for me, right? Things that I would have to go out and spend hours kind of orienting myself and figuring out this, starting with a template, finding some help forum where somebody's done something that's vaguely related, it can get me 90% of the way there and then I can do the last 10%. I would not have thought that was possible before ChatGPT came along. In fact, I probably would have argued fairly strongly that it wasn't possible. Uh, because the generation that came before, uh, of AI that came before, it didn't deserve in any way to be called AI. It really was just a very, very thin surface layer of kind of association. ChatGPT has all of the formal inventiveness of language. Is it going to create a new Shakespeare? I don't think so. That, that level of generation, right? But it is taking the store of human thought. I don't know that it is creative in the sense of inspiration that people are, but it is generative. It is able to make new things that were not there before. And most human creation you could describe in, in some way. Everything that we do is bound, unless you're Shakespeare or, or one of the true historical geniuses. Everything you're doing is, in some sense, bound by the space of what, what came before you. And I think it is able to explore in an open-ended way, uh, in a way that no previous technological paradigm has been able to do. It, it's terrible at explaining the kind of jokes seven-year-olds laugh at. <laughs> a huge gap. It doesn't understand humor, because humor is a kind of association which is, which is not formal. And unless it knows the joke and it's analyzed it before, it comes up with really stupid stuff. Uh, I mean, that, I, in spare moments, I like to tease hell out of chat GPT by feeding in particularly Jewish jokes and asking them to try to explain it. <laughs> Although if you look at Plotinus, Kant, Henri Bergson, philosophers who have analyzed humor, it's not like chat GPT is far behind them. I, I will say, though, if you wanted a place where generative AI is actually doing amazingly generative things in the sense in which you mean the word generative, pharmaceuticals. Um, what's going on there is they're analyzing drug interactions that are currently exist, and they're predicting out what other <coughs> hormones would do, what other uh, chemicals would do. Uh, and since, after all, it's the, the key cost of new pharmaceutical usage is development. 
um, where you don't know when you start what the result is going to be. You have no pathway. It doesn't mean that AI is always right, but if it can identify a pathway with a 50% greater chance of uh, working, um, that's an amazing reduction in cost, and that's what's happening in the pharmaceutical world right now. And when that teams up with quantum, <clears throat> quantum computing, um, and is able to use that technology as well, then you're going to get even greater precision. I mean, and again, all the way down, all the way down to the sub molecular level in terms of that kind of predictive modeling. Again, that's why every big pharma company has a massive research operation in China, where you have the largest medical databases. Yeah, to do that. I was going to say the, the applications in medicine are huge um, for for population health, for personalized health. Um, in a way, everybody will have, in effect, their own cardiologist, their own oncologist, prior to you actually getting anything. Because you can really go into the depths of the data. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a funny story, though. One of my first forays with ChatGPT was to ask it to write me a letter of reference. And it wrote me a very nice, glowing letter of reference. I was sort of reading it. Well, oh, that would be good. Then I asked it to write my obituary. Oh, and it said no. And I said, so we're having this sort of pseudo conversation. Well, you know all these things about me because you've written this beautiful uh, letter of reference. Can't you convert it into an obituary? And it refused to do it. It said, you don't write them before people have died. So I go back and say, well, actually, a lot of people have their obituaries <laughs> written before they've died. They just don't publish them. It would never write my obituary. And it knew a lot about me. Years ago, uh, I was asked to do an obituary for the Times of London. And... Uh, it was such a famous place to write obituaries for that I said yes. And then they asked me for another and another. And then they asked me for file copies of obituaries for people who weren't dead yet that I knew personally. And that's where we stopped writing <laughs> obituaries for the Times of London. There was some, that was just one step too far. So in this case, I'm with chat GPT. <laughs> you know, one of the other, <clears throat> speaking of pharmaceuticals and all these issues, one of the other key battlegrounds between the U.S. and China for the future of AI is going to be in the area of standards, uh, international standards bodies. Um, the Chinese have learned, and not just of the AI, but with other technologies as well, how important it is to seize control over the agenda for international standards bodies. This is just beginning to happen, I think, with AI. It's just beginning to realize that it's important to set international standards. <clears throat> the Chinese have learned how to position themselves very well to make sure that the standards for, that are matched by a certain technology are standards that they set based on their agenda and that others are going to follow along with this. When I, when I was, I put together a couple of years ago a consortium of companies and labs to develop a global standards for two quantum uh, technologies, for uh, quantum random number generators and also for quantum key distribution. And we took these to Geneva, to the International Telecommunications Union and their security unit. You know, it's a vast or organization in Geneva. But Section 17 is, the, is security, because these were both uh, security technologies, right, for cybersecurity. And um, at the end of the session, when our QRNG standard was approved, uh, including the Russians and Chinese voted for it, too. Uh, but we had to wait the next year for the QKD. But when the session ended and everybody adjourned, you know, the big plenary session, all the nations are there. All of the Chinese uh, participants in the, uh, in the delegations for the, for the ITU Section 17 all went up to the dais to have a group photo taken. There must have been 25 of them. There, all lined up, you know, all who were involved in submitting proposals for this or that particular change for international standards in, cyber, in security, cybersecurity, and telecommunications security. There's been 20, 25 of them. And then the Koreans got the idea, we're going to do the same thing. So they went up, and there were about nine or ten of them, they had their group photo taken. The U.S. representative, this is 2019, the U.S. representatives for submitting standards that year, there were two of us. And neither one of us knew that the other was going to be there. Now, th things have improved somewhat. And now there's been much more, particular by the Quantum Economic Development Consortium, 
when they heard this story and knew what was going on, they've taken a more active role in trying to provide and work on the standard side. But if we think about these in, in the terms that I do, as you know, in terms of Cold War and the conflict between U.S. and China, the issue of standards is one where the U.S. has a lot of ground to make up for, and AI would be a great place in which to, in which to put its foot forward. This is certainly true in hardware. We wonder about measuring systems and software, however, because it seems to me that, that previously um, the gaps were difficult, that ordinary differences became almost incompatible by design or had the effect of being incompatible with design, like the difference between the Avoir du Bois and, and English system that we still use in America for weights and measures and the Celsius system, the, the French system that most of the rest of the world uses. And that seemed, you used to see every year in the newspaper, some science popularizing writer would say, the moon is however many thousand miles away from the earth. And every high school physics teacher would write in saying, you must never mention a scientific topic without saying it in kilometers. Um, you know, that this was a moral stand on the part of physicists. Computers erase a lot of that because the translation is so fast. Now, my mother kept on the fridge a little magnet that's, that had conversions from, you know, ounces to uh, kilograms and so on. Uh, and now you don't need it. You know, you just, you're, you're, the recipes online will do that for you automatically. And it seems to me that the speed with which we can do conversions means that some of these differences in standards don't matter as much as they might have. Uh, and in signals sure processing that. communications, it's, 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 it's critical because uh, if you control the standards, you, can, you control a great deal of the manufacturing. It's all, uh, the, the Chinese have put a huge amount of effort to dominate the definition of what 5G standards, what uh, bandwidth you can use, what part of the spectrum, uh, speeds of transit. That's it, it's a very big deal. Uh, Arthur's completely right about that. And with, is, uh, and with AI, there is a lot of AI-oriented hardware uh, as well, yeah. especially the new technologies where, again, setting the standards for manufacturing or IP for these kinds of things will, becomes – you dominate standards, you dominate the future. And Arthur's of, of a, of, repeated of mention of quantum computing, which is basically the substitution for electricity of quantum effects. Um, at its highest level. Um, Arthur's mentioned it several times, this is going to make a huge difference when we succeed in building practicable computing that uses this. Well, not just, not just by itself, but also, as I say, integrated with right. the development of hybrid systems with AI, which is already underway. Uh, this is going to be, I'm sorry, not with AI yet, but people are beginning to realize the degree to which if these two technologies, and we'll call AI a technology for this purpose, even though the, the, the physical basis is different, right, of quantum physics versus digital technology, different, it's a different science, it's a different uh, view of nature, but by bringing them together in hybrid systems, you'll be able to accelerate the development of both. And the question then becomes, can we use AI to help us develop the next generation after that? Oh, with no question. And that's no question. Be, you know, this is what worried, there's a really wonderfully dated kind of worry about computers that came out of 1950s science fiction. Uh, and this was its worry, that, you know, computers would design computers, would design computers, and we would end up unable to understand what we, what had been created, and that this would be uh, you know, catastrophic. Isn't that also the driving fear for behind a lot of artificial intelligence? <laughs> it's precisely that same, that same dynamic. Right, that's, you know, one day Skynet wakes up and kills us all. That was this last, or not last, but that was a descendant of this 1950s worry of computers. And you understand, at that point, they would have had to tear down this wall to put the computer in here, right? And it wouldn't have as much processing power as your cell phone. Uh, you, would, you would agree, Joe, that, that that worry is much more plausible now, right? Uh, is that is that your point, or are you saying that it is now obsolete? Um, yeah, that, you know that worry. 
I, I really don't have much worry that AI is going to eat my soul. Well, I just mean that it's unpredictable and that we can't understand how it works. Well, on that note, uh, thank you very much, panelists. Thank you very much, audience. Thank you for coming. Let's thank our panelists.